You are now tuned into the Fathers Matter 2 podcast, where we discuss family, careers, community, health, and all the other stuff you just might not talk about in the barbershop. Sponsored by Port Royal Paddies and Father Figure Children and Family Services, with your host, Dave Mullins. Fathers Matter 2. Right, so we say welcome to um, our very, very first edition of the uh, brand new podcast called the Fathers Matter 2 podcast and um, um, have great pleasure in welcoming Dr. Neville Lawrence to my kitchen in my home. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing fine so far. I, I'm really grateful yeah. and thankful for you um, coming here today it's a to, to, to take part in our very first podcast. The, as I said, it's the Father's Matter 2 podcast. It's sponsored by um, Port Royal Patties, as well as Father Figure Children and Family Services. And um, I want to say thanks to our sponsors as well for um, trusting us with their brand yeah. and trusting that we'll, we'll, we'll um, represent them well. Yeah, I'm sure you will. Um, so again, thank you for coming. And I guess let's let's get started. I, and uh, you know, for those who were listening or, or maybe even watching us, uh, Dr. Neville Lawrence may or may not be known to you. Um, he's known to many for the unfortunate um, tragedy that took place in his family back in um, 1993, when his son Stephen Lawrence was um, tragically murdered by. Um, some racist fucks um, who eventually eventually some of whom were, were brought to justice yeah, um, and, and, and essentially that's why many of us know who you are yeah, unfortunately, um, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, but we're not going to talk too holistically too much about Stephen today um, whilst obviously we acknowledge that you know, he's, he's the reason why you are here today. Um, I, I, I wanted for the purpose of um, this podcast to to focus on you, the man, the father, Neville Lawrence. Um, and obviously by, by doing that, we, we will definitely speak about Stephen yeah. and, and, and on those unfortunate events, but that's not all we're gonna talk about okay, today. Okay, fine. So, what I didn't know, Doctor, is that you're a football fan, as am I. <laughs> yeah, I'm a Manchester City man. He's a Man City fan. Can you believe this? <laughs> well, two Londoners supporting teams from um, up north. I'm a Liverpool fan. Yeah. And um, Happy New Year, I should say. Happy, Happy New 2019. Year to you and your family. For and to, same to 2019. you. 2019. Um, and it's looking at the moment, I'm hoping, that um, it could be a good year for my team. Yeah. Um, Liverpool, but we won't we won't dwell on that too much. <laughs> we won't dwell on that too much. So let's get straight into it. Um, where were you born? Where did you grow up? I was born in in Jamaica, Kingston, mm-hmm. uh, 1942. Okay. Uh, my mother and father. My mother name is um, Hilda Chu. My father is Adrian Lawrence. Okay. I had a very nice upbringing. Mm-hmm. Uh, questions were asked um, in the first instant because my grandmother, she's a Jew. Oh, your grandmother was a Jew? My mother, grandmother is a Jew. And born in Jamaica? Uh, born in Germany. Born in Germany? In Germany. Wow. Uh, question which I was asked in all the time when I was growing up was, how come I had a white mother? Mm-hmm. And um, all the other kids whose mother and father came to school, school were, were black. And in our society, you can't ask questions. Right. So, the questions which I wanted to ask, I couldn't. So, stick a pin. You were brought up by your white Jewish mother. My grandmother, yeah. And your father? And my father. In Jamaica. In Jamaica. And, and your grandmother was your paternal grandmother or yeah. maternal, paternal. Yeah, paternal. Wow. And so how did you end up growing up with grandma and dad as opposed to mum and dad? Well, our society in the early days, if you're 
mother had a child before she was married. Sometimes was the, the, par the par parents who turned her out. Mm -hmm. And so in order for my mother to, to go work, my right. grandmother decided to take me first time for her, her son. She only had one son, right. which was my father. Okay. So when, as I said, my grandmother decided, and um, it's such a, a story that sometimes people wouldn't believe it, that my grandmother, the question which I was asking is how come my grandmother was living in Jamaica? I'm thinking the same thing. How did a Jewish, Jewish German, German um, woman <laughs> white woman living, end up white, living in Jamaica? And it took a long time before I was watching a series mm. and saw that some of the Jews were leaving Germany and going to America. Right. But they had to stop off at Cuba before they go to Germany, to, right. come to, to the United States. Right. My grandmother's parents came off at Cuba oh. and eventually ended up in, in Jamaica. Jamaica. <laughs> if you wrote that in a book, I'd, I'd think it's a bit yeah. far-fetched. Yeah, well, when um, you can see the, the disbelief sometimes when I tell them because my, my friend went to Jamaica, gave him some money mm -hmm. to give to my grandmother, told him where she was. He went to the house, saw my grandmother, didn't ask her who she was and brought the money back to, to, to England. Thinking that she was the wrong person. Yeah. This is not the right, I've gone to the wrong place. Exactly. Oh. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. So, what kind of child were you growing up? Well, in a sense, you would say I was spoiled. You were spoiled? Because my grandmother didn't hit me. Did the, it? the only time maybe I would get um, any kind of uh, flogging or anything like that would yeah. be from my father. Right. And he was not one of those people who normally do that very often. Right. I had to do, do something really bad. For him to, to resort to physical yeah. chastisement. But um, I suppose people who don't know a lot about Jamaica don't know the, the kind of houses we used to live in. Which mm. It was um, high off the ground, so he had a cellar. Yeah. And, and if, if I did anything wrong and I know my father was going to beat me, he'd have to catch me first. Okay. And sometimes we'd run around the house right. and then I'd go underneath the house and he'd be running around thinking I'm running. <laughs> and I was looking at him, I see him running underneath. <laughs> so I, I have to say I was blessed in a way. Yeah. yeah because this woman, um, my grandfather was a, a maroon. Okay. And um, so, uh, uh, the fact that my grandmother actually spoke to a black person was a problem for her family as well. Right. So they disowned her. So I only saw one of my, my grandmother's sister who s supported her, who they also turned out. So okay. it was my grandmother and her sister. And every now and again I'd see a hunk, um, one of our brother whose family was still in Cuba right. come and visit her. Right. And so it's like a black boy seeing all these white people and knowing that they're relatives, but couldn't understand but and couldn't ask. Because and couldn't ask because that was yeah. taboo back yeah. then. You just didn't ask. Yeah, so as I say, I was spoiled because my grandmother never be beat me yeah. or scold me. You know, right. So I got away with murder in a sense. Wow, okay. <laughs> so tell me about, so if your grandma was Jewish, tell me a bit about religious religion-wise. How did that work? Did Well... Um, she wasn't a religious person, right? But where my my first religion came in mm -hmm. was when I started school. Right. I went to a Catholic school mm -hmm. because this, the the, um, the school was owned by the Catholic people. Right. So my first um, what you would say introduction to Christianity was through the Catholic Church, and I've always been one of those persons who kind of read a little bit more than I could understand. Mm. And so when I saw these images of Mary and all these people, things in the churches, yeah. I used to question, why are they doing this? The Bible said you should have images of people. Right. Yeah. So they used to have this thing called Lavina, where they would have the Mary in a, a made of, with flowers and things, marching around the schools mm -hmm. and things, and I didn't, I didn't take part in that. Right. So my my first, my first, um, what you say, introduction to my mother, because I didn't 
know my mother from the early days. Right. Let's think about when I was about eight or nine. And um, one evening, my grandmother said to me, your mother is coming to see you. And how did you feel about and that? And I'm thinking, he was well, confused. She, she's my mother, you know, what, what's she talking about? Wow. So when this woman came and she introduced me as her, my mother, I refused to, to say yes. I said, no, you're not my mother. You know, the person I saw over my crib while I was a child was your grandma. Was my grandma and that was your mom. at me all the time, yeah. not you. Yeah. So <clears throat> it took a long time, even after quite a few years after I met her, to actually call her mother. And even after calling her mother, my mother was still my grandmother. Well, you you had that early attachment, as yes, we say, yes, to so, your grandmother, yes, so that's so, understandable. Um, eventually, I learned a lot about the fact that my grandmother was disowned by her peer, our parents mm -hmm. and our family and some of the history about why my grandmother took me and then you start thinking if somebody had such a bad experience with a the family then would you take that child yeah but my grandmother she did, did. so she you know did. i'm grateful for, to her for a lot she, of things she's a hero really yeah yeah and yeah. the way she grew me up stays with me yeah and so it's like thinking about somebody who had a tragedy in their life to and still stick to what they believed in. The principles. Yes. So that that brings me on actually to another question because I mean, it sounds obviously like your grandmother really informed and um, inspired your the person you obviously became and grew into. What about your father? Um, what? How, how much would you say you've taken on from your father's influence with regards to whether it be positive, negative or both or, and, and all under the sun. What, what are some of the things that you would say that you've maybe taken on from your dad and, and, and him growing up? I mean, was he was he a young father as well? And obviously well, your he, mum was he young. Was, he was quite young and he was a, um, a tanner, late, a, um, leather tanner. He okay. In the factory. Yeah, yeah. But he's, he was never like a bully or mm -hmm. anybody who kind of treat me really bad. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe the instilled, the way my grandmother instilled in him as well, yeah. the way to live, yeah. he's, he also, it also went down to him. Mm -hmm. So I, I, as again, I'm saying I was fortunate. And yeah. I, I got away w with murder. Was, was your relationship with your dad more of an older brother relationship or was it father it was relationship? Like a, it was like a brother. He was more like your older yeah, brother, was wasn't brother. he? So he looked out for you, made yeah. sure you... Yeah. Uh, okay. And my, my, my grandmother influenced him a lot. Yeah. I think he, he kind of loved his mother so much. God, again, yeah. he was the only child. Mm -hmm. So, you know... He was also spoiled before. Yeah, yeah. Before me, right, so it right. came from him to me. <laughs> so, so going back a bit, you you, in, you got introduced to your mum at the age of eight, and um, what was that relationship? What happened then? On did you have? A, did you then form a relationship with her, or, or it was again? Maybe she just really was like an aunt to you she was like a, a lot of relative yes she, I, I, it took me a long time to start even thinking that she was Your my mom. mother yeah and so my my grandmother tried to influence me to give her a little bit more of my life yes but i i wanted to stay with my grandmother so it took a long time mm -hmm. i think um it wasn't until i left school right that my grandmother started to hint about me making my my mother a little bit more of my life yeah right. So my mother had a second child, which is my sister. Mm -hmm. And um, the same mother that turned her out took my sister okay. and raised her. So your grandma's? My other grandmother yes. took my sister, the second child that my mother had, wow. and raised her. Okay. So they were quite wealthy. My, right. my second grandmother, they were quite well did. Right. So the kind of life my my sister grew up in was completely different from mine. Right. You know, so like totally my my mind. grandmother was poor. You know, my right. my side of my because of because the, the fact that she fact was that she was a, yeah she was out by her father yeah so she because they were wealthy right but because they, she had crossed the line about the the way they thought. Yes. she should have maybe spoke to somebody white or mm. somebody with more influence yes, and money. Yeah, someone more successful, so, yeah. supposedly. So they turned her away from the family. Right. So it wasn't until uh, I think I was about 14 when my, grandma, my, my mother's mother died that my mother was able to kind of intrigue with me to start making her more 
making me more yeah, part, part of, of her, her life. life. That she took my, my my sister. She had to take my sister. Okay. So my sister then lived with my mother, and I used to, I because I grew up with, with friends. Yes. Not, yes. Not a relative, mm -hmm. like say my sister. And I also had a brother. Right. By the time I my mother tried to get me to be more part of her life. Right. So I had a sister and a brother. Right. And um, I started to more kind of be more part of their lives. Okay. So then. My mother was a Seventh-day Adventist. Right, which, which is how you now become yeah. a bit more involved. So I'm seeing a different kind of relig religion that I had known in first place. Because which was Catholic. Which was Catholic. Yeah, and very different. And very different, no images and things in yeah. the church. Much that, more spiritual, yeah, I would that, say, yeah. So I used to visit my mother on the weekends. Right. And say, be a part of, of a little bit more of her life. And then the influence. So that of changed your Saturday altogether. Yeah, that changed <laughs> Saturday. Saturday, Saturday entirely. total change. <laughs> yeah, so then I start to see a different religion, right. With no images, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I start to think about maybe this is a this better is, kind of right. religion. So, what age did you come to to, to the UK? And and how? my 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 mother had a sister, and she had no children, mm -hmm. and so. When, the, when when I started to be part of my mother life, her sister took a liking to me. Mm -hmm. So she used to kind of, in a sense, like adopt me as her son. Right. So when my when my mother's sister got married and came to England in the early days, she wanted me because they had no kids. She had wanted to come over. She wanted her as me well. to come over. Right. So she, they at the time you used to come to England by boat. Yeah, my dad came over on a boat. So she went <laughs> and paid my 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 fear yeah. to come to England. But I was at trade at the time. I was learning to be an upholsterer. Okay. So I was at trade. Learning, like your dad. Yeah, to be an upholsterer, and I didn't want to leave. I wanted to stay and finish my upholstery. So just after she started to push for me to come to this country, they had a problem with Egypt, with the, the Suez Canal situation. Right. And in the early days, you know, they used to have um, young people used to be put in the army. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my mother then said that I wouldn't be coming because she yeah. didn't want me to go in the army. Right. So I stayed back in Jamaica. And because she had paid the money already, my sister came in my, in my space. Right. So she had my sister as of her, as our child, mm. but still was insisting that I come. come as well. So after a while, when things started to die down a little bit with the Swiss Canal situation, yeah. Yeah. she went ahead and, and booked my fear again. Right. But then I decided I don't want to come because I started to know about this. Some of my relatives were come going to Amer America. Okay. And wanted me to go to America. Right. But then with this. Uh, racist business about you going to a black toilet and yeah, uh, no blacks, and, no and, Irish, no and dogs. And hearing all these things. Used to be in Jamaica where I could go anywhere I wanted, and I said I wasn't gonna come. So it ended up that my auntie then sent for a, a girl that she had um, more or less took taken over from our family and mm -hmm. raised her. Yeah. So she came instead. So it went on so twice. So, so twice, yeah, twice, twice people came in your in your space. Anyway, I thought I'd be okay, but my <laughs> my auntie insisted. She really wanted you. So she went and paid money again for me to come. Third time. I can't remember what happened on the third time, but I still didn't come. Whoa! Somebody else came instead. <laughs> and I've I've never been one of those people who really wanted to leave Jamaica and come anywhere. Anyway, so right. I was pleased you that were, things wasn't working out. Yeah. But the last time when she did come, I had to. So I came here in, in August 1960. And how did you travel? Did you come on a boat I as well? I traveled by British, British, British Overseas Airway. Okay. Which is now British, okay. British Airway. Yes. So it was on a plane. Mm -hmm. And I think something like 14 hours. Yeah. Um, where you go to New York or stop somewhere. Over. Stop over and then from there to here. So when I came, um, I was kind of taken back by the fact that I had left a house in Jamaica where there was three bathrooms and three toilets and then being told that I had to put six pence in the thing to have a bath and the toilet was out in the backyard and I started to think, you know, well, Why this is a, a, I'm leaving a third world country and this is supposed to be Great Britain, so how comes, you know, 
<laughs> this is what I'm seeing. So, in a sense, I felt that I should have stayed home. Yeah, well, I'm not surprised. I think a lot of people did. Um, I would have felt yeah, that way when they've come. Yeah. yeah. So, I, I take it um, sometime after coming here, you would have met Doreen. Um, quite a while. It, 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 it took quite a while because we first, I first came here in, um, to Kentish Town. Mm hmm. Then we moved from Kentish Town to Tottenham. Yeah. I think I spent the first four, three, three years, and then I decided that we, with one of my friends, which became really close to me, a guy named Winston, mm. to go to Jamaica for holiday. So we went to Jamaica for holiday. But on the way to Jamaica, we had a problem where the plane took off from Gatwick. And while we were over France, the plane caught fire with us. What? And um, I still, when I talk about it, I still think, you know, I saw this plane just started to shoot to the water and um, it was about 12 o'clock in the night and we actually saw the water and I thought that was it. Somehow the plane went back up, came back to Gatwick. Um, it took us to spend the night in a hotel overnight and then the following day they told us that the plane was ready so they took us back the, the same plane the same plane Lord. because it was a shell it was not normal shell it was you they had to lease this plane it mm -hmm. was like a, a um a group of people who had decided to have an excursion right so it wasn't the ordinary plane so they took us back to the Atric airport the following morning telling us the plane was ready and we, we had to sleep rough in the airport for about three days before the plane came back. So I was looking at those people with this drone thing and I, I know exactly <laughs> what they what came through saying. being in the airport for so much sleeping hours. Sleeping on the floor in the airport. Wow. Your, so your plane caught on fire? Yeah, but it's, the, the, yeah, one of the engine caught because I was sitting next to the window. And, and it was, was on your side as and well? And it was on my side. Oh my I was God. saying to my friend, that wing, that, fire, that uh, engine is, is on fire. And he said, no. And then next thing, the woman was showing us how to take out the, the, the belt to put it on in case of anything. And then the plane just pushed her straight to the window, to the door where the passion, yeah, yeah, and all the lights and the bells and things start ringing. And people start jumping up and shouting, oh God, oh God, save me, Jesus Christ. <laughs> all who never believe in God now. Yeah, but I just sat there. <laughs> so how are you on planes now? Given that experience, it are took you me 11 years to fly again. fly again? I'm not surprised. So when I came back, and I had only really promised that I was going to go back to Jamaica in five years' time, I decided I wasn't going to go on a plane. So I went back to Jamaica in 1965 by a boat. Okay. And I stayed in Jamaica for a year with no idea that I was going to come back to this country. And then I came back after a year. And I went back to live in Tottenham for a little while. Mm -hmm. And then um, I, I was working with a company in um, Tottenham. I got a job doing the upholstery, working with this company right. in Tottenham. And the first time when I started this redundancy thing, was made redundant. Right. And one of my friend, um, um, mother, had a factory doing spade and leather. And because I had been trained as a upholster, I had to be able to sew. So they said to me I should come and help them, you know, mm -hmm. stick the, the coats down. You know, you, the seams has to be stick down yeah. before you can put the lining in. Yeah. So I was doing that. And um, they had the spare machine in the, in the factory. And one of them said to me, but never no, you can sew. I saw, so I said, yes. I said, well, I can't sew your stuff that you're sewing here now. They said, well, we're going to show you what to do. And you can practice until you can do it properly. Right. And the first day, they, they gave me this coat and showed me the back and the size and the sleeves and to how to put it together. And the first day, I made one coat. On your first day? On my first day, I made one coat. Sweet. Second day, I made two. And by the weekend, I was making six and seven coats. Okay. And so, um, I got really good at it. I was living in a place called Crowland Road. This woman that had the factory had a spare room in our house and she also had a little factory at the back of our house. So in the evenings when she leave work, she'll go home and start sewing in there as well. Okay. So I, I moved to that place with her and I had a room there. Mm -hmm. And so I used to go to work in the mornings and come back in the evening and then sit and, and, and do coats and things. So they used to do um, 
codes for a factory down in Enfield. Mm -hmm. And um, because they used to, they used to they, they used to send them out the work and they used to fix down to sew the work and then send it back. Mm -hmm. But each person used to have a bundle of clothes where they tied tie up that bond with their right. record and their name would go on that before they send it in case anything is wrong. Right. They, You'd they have they to know repair who, it. Right. So it, apparently the, the owner of the the, the, comp, the the factory saw a bundle of my coat and uh, he asked her who did this and she said it was me. So he said that he wants me to come and work in the factory. So you were headhunted. <laughs> so <laughs> I went to the factory and started working and I was making something like 15 coats a day. Okay. And at that time, you know, 15 coats a day, sometimes you get 15 pounds to do one coat. So that's good earning money. And 15 money. pounds was a lot of money back <laughs> yeah. then. Yeah, I was earning quite a bit of money. Okay. So I, I, I worked with that company until I decided I was going to leave Tottenham and go to live in in Broccoli. So I moved from I moved from um, Tottenham to Broccoli mm -hmm. and I was still driving from Broccoli to, uh, to, to Enfield to every morning. Mm -hmm. And then one morning when I was going to work, somebody came out of a side turn and hit the car in the side, split, spun it around, heading back to where it was going. And um, I was uh, without a car for quite a while because the insurance took so long to, to pay out. Yeah. So I had to give up the job. Oh, so when I gave up that job that was in Handfield, I started going to Old Street because there was quite a lot of Sweden leather yeah. people in Old yeah. Street. So I started going to Old Street and working from Old Street and eventually working with some really um, with a top class company. The last one I worked with was one called Begador that had their their offices in Bond Street. Okay. So as I worked with those people for quite a while mm -hmm. until when I started to leave because of the influx of the people from Uganda, right. the, the wages became started to get low because they were doing less, they were asking for less, less money. money. Right. So I, I started to, to, there was a paper called um, Hackney Gazette. Mm -hmm that used to advertise work for people who did, like say, dressmakers and every kind of work. So I started looking in that paper, found this place down in Bond Street, as I said, and I used to go collect the work from them and then sew them and then take them back home. So I don't remember what happened, but um, some, in some way I managed, I think it was to do with um, Doreen Mother, right. was a, um, dressmaker as well. Okay. And um, met her, and sh sh I was telling her about the fact that I used to get work from the paper. You, have a company. you know, yeah. she, she asked me if I could get her some work. So right. I started going and picking up work from some of the factories in Hackney, and then I started getting some dressmaking work, um, work for her as well. Okay. So after a while, she said to me, she's at the house in the days by herself sewing. So she had a room where she sewed. She said, maybe it'd be a good idea to buy another machine mm. and then stay Start and working. sew yeah. both of us together. So that's how I managed yeah. to meet okay. Lori from, okay. that, from the mother. That, from, from yeah. mom. Okay, we're going to take a break um, and get our sponsors to be heard. And we'll be back in a short while. Have you been wrongfully denied access to your child and don't know what to do or who to talk to? On average, family solicitors charge £250 per hour. However, at Father Figure Children and Family Services, we offer free consultation and a service with a real personal feel at just a fraction of that price. We provide telephone meetings, complete paperwork, accompany you to court negotiate with the respondent's solicitor, but what makes us really stand out is the coaching and support we provide to our clients. Visit www.fatherfigure.org.uk and book yourself a free consultation now. Okay, so welcome back to um, the Fathers Matter 2 podcast. We're here in my kitchen mm -hmm. and um, eating patties, but yes. we're going to eat some more food later on. I'm um, here with Dr. Neville Lawrence. Um, we've just heard loads about his upbringing, how he even got to England, and um, we've just we've just kind of um, 
got up to the stage of him meeting um, Doreen, who would go on to be his wife and mother of, of children. So um, I, I take it, having met Doreen through her mum yeah. and sharing the same kind of uh, career, I guess, in um, seamstressing, is that the, is that yeah, the correct the, word? Is that dress the correct maker, dress maker, like, and et cetera. Yeah. Um, you, you then go on to start dating Doreen, I take it, and yeah, get married. We, we started um, courting, as they were saying, you know, and uh, like I say, we, we talked about this before, that the fact that I, at the time, never thought I'd ever come back to England. Mm. Um, met with Doreen, mother, then met with her, mm -hmm. and we started dating. And after a while, I, I had decided, because of my, my mother's problem that she had, that I wouldn't um, live with a woman unless okay. I was married. Okay. So when we started going out, we went out for a while and then the time came when, and at the time, um, if um, uh, the person wasn't 21, you couldn't get married. Right. So Doreen wasn't 21 when we decided, so we had to have mother consent and father and agree. consent. So yeah. we got that. Uh, we got married. Uh, and it was, I think, two years after our marriage before we got married in the 4th of November, 1972. And um, sometime in those days, people wouldn't get married unless the, the person was expecting a yeah, child. Yeah, yeah. And they call that gun, gunshot wedding? Yeah, there was rumor that, <laughs> that she was pregnant. She was pregnant. Okay. And people keep looking and seeing no child. <laughs> they realize. <laughs> Say, two years after Stephen became okay, first your firstborn, yeah. I was a little bit worried because I was 30 years old when. I got married to Dory, she was 20. Right. And I was worried because all my other friends had had children early. Already. And yeah. I got married early, I got children. Mm. And so I was pleased, you know, that yeah. at least I had a son. Yeah. So after working in the building, in the um the the, the rag trade for a while, things got after we got married, things started to get a bit funny. Well, I'm earning money, so we decided. I used to go um, with a friend that was a builder. He's a floor, floor screener. Right. Like, say, on holiday and work with him. And um, he said to me when I started having problem money wise that I should maybe come and work on the building. Right. But from being in a, a clean environment, to come here with building sand trade. and cement and things. And a lot heavier work. And heavy lifting, heavy things, which I never did before. Right. But then it came to the stage where I had to. Yeah. So I went on the building site. Fortunately for me, the, 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 the man that was in charge was a, was a Scottish guy. And I've heard many people talk about how mean Scots people were. Right. This guy wasn't Nothing a like typical that. Scottish guy, and yeah. he took a liking to me. Mm. And from the very first day that I went on site, he said to me, you try and learn as quick as possible. And as soon as you can do things by yourself, I'll take you. Right. And um, I was working with two plasterers, so it was hard work mm. taking stuff upstairs and things. So I used to be under the stairs practicing, you know. He bought me my first um, chowel and, and harp. Yeah. So I could start practicing. Yeah, yeah. I worked with them for quite a while at the time. I think um, my wages was about forty pound per week compared with what I used to earn before. He was earning fifteen pound per coat, coats, doing fifteen yeah. coats yeah, in a day. day. Yeah, Jesus. So now I had family because mm. um, Dorian had Stephen, mm -hmm. and um, expenses was more because then I had to I had to rent a, a flat. Mm -hmm. Fortunate for me, um, well, 15 of us decided that we were going to put our money together mm. and buy houses and fix them up. Right. So we bought the first house down um, and fixed it up and were so, uh, we were so fortunate that the first property that we bought, we had um, a two bedroom flat upstairs and downstairs was a, was a shop. We turned the shop into an off license. 
Okay. I used to sell liquor to people who were having the pushing and the right. dances. And yeah, the, yeah, yeah. We used to make a lot of money. Okay. The unfortunate thing for us is that the, the guy who was one of the guys who influenced us to start working on the building, he and his family, we they were quite wealthy in a way because he had shares in this company. So we made him in charge of this company, him and his wife. We then bought the second house, which was the one in, top, in, um, in, in Woolwich, mm -hmm. on Woolwich Common. Um, that was uh, a three bedroom upstairs and one bedroom downstairs. And um, we moved into the place before we had Stephen. Yeah. So I took the one bedroom downstairs. We used to have a, a meeting every month to see what was happening with the company. The finances, etc. Yeah. And um, we thought everything was okay. This guy then formed another company and was siphoning off the money from our company into his. So in those days, if you borrowed money from an unsharp loan, you had to pay it back. Yeah. So we thought everything was fine. Uh, just after Stephen and um, a couple of years after we were in this place, um, Dory became pregnant with Stuart. Right. One evening, one morning I was going to work, the guy took me to work because someone decided that we used to work, but he used to be in charge of it. Right. While I was at work, she called me and told me that there was Bailey Bailey came to door. turn us out of the house. My wife is expecting a child with a child and now has to be looking to go somewhere. Anyway, we went to court and the, the, the court man at the court told me that if I had my rent book fully paid out, I should put my hand up and the judge start calling out the case and then show him the book to tell him that the, the, the bailiff the, the note that the bailiff has is invalid or is invalid because yeah. it hasn't got my name on it. Right. So that would give me six months before they would be able to change it. Yes. So that's what I did. Okay. And when um, we went to the council, they put us up in a, in a, in a flat down in Woolwich. Right. So we moved out of the place, went into a flat into Woolwich. But um, one of the things which I wasn't too keen of was to be in the flat because we I think it was on the second floor, you have about four or five floors above, above you, and people used to make noise and things. Yeah. Fortunately for me, I started working with another company who was making these houses down nearby where we mm -hmm. live. And um, I think I did that house the week before I just finished the house. Went indoors the evening, and there was a letter from the council saying that we had a house. It's the very same house that I just finished. Working, working on. on. You're kidding. <laughs> I got that house. <laughs> You've got some stories, Neville, man. Yeah, I got the very house that I finished working on. So when I got the, the, the thing, I said to my wife, I just finished that house last week. I know what it is. It was a three bedroom house. Yeah. You know, with garden. So we moved from that okay. to, to there. And um, quite a few years later, Georgina came. Right. So instead of having two boys, I had two boys and, and a, a girl. girl. Doreen was doing her. She started, she, she, she decided she wanted to be a teacher. So she went to college. And so she, before she went to college, she used to do, she used to work for the um, not press. But because she wanted a, a career, as I said, she started working with the school at first. As a supply, te as a, um, you know, the, what is teaching it? assistant. Church, yes, church, church teaching assistant. Mm -hmm. But then there was cuts. She yes. lost the job, right? And she decided she wanted to go to university. So she went to university. Then there was this big slump in the building trade, and a lot of people start losing jobs their stuff. jobs and yeah. things. So I used to work. I'm um, self-employed after finishing my. I trade and was you now qualified um, plaster. I used to get lots of work from lots of people all over the place. You know, mm -hmm. Sometimes I had so much work I had to give it to other people. But then when 
this session started with housing system. Like I used to have work for the work, like I say, I finished work on, on in December and for the whole year next year I would have work for the whole year. Wow. So all that started to drop and my work came from recommendation from other people. Right. So then it got to a stage where I had no work and um, one of the this thing that I used to kind of not want to do is to go and ask for assistance from, from the government. government. So I had to do that in order to keep keep our house because mm. that, that's after that after the the time when they started um, telling people that they could buy the, the right, council buy. houses, yeah. we started to, to buy. Just, so yeah. it was the fact that if I didn't go there, we would have you lost, lost the house. You would have lost so everything. They, they, they paid the interest on right. me, your loan. On the, on, right. So I, we struggled for a long while. Mm. And um, I used to go, sometimes I used to get little jobs, some something to keep us going in a sense. Yeah. But not as much as I and used to when I was yeah, working. Yeah. So things were very tight. Anyway, um, I think uh, um, one one year when Doreen had to go on field trip, I was looking after the children for that week while right. she was away in Birmingham. The night before she came, the day before she came back, the, the same day before she came back, I remember saying to Stephen, um, don't go anywhere. Right. Come straight home. Your mom's coming back from field trip thing. Anyway, the reason why I did that is that I had a dream. And I still can't understand this dream. The dream was I saw I was on the common uh, where they fly kites and things. Um, and when I was on this common, I saw a group of boys coming towards me. And this was long before the, the, the day when I, the, the week when I said to Steve not to, right. to go anywhere. To so go. you had this dream a long while before, dream, but long, it was something that stayed with you yeah, because you I didn't. I had this dream. And one of the other things which sometimes people used to say about one of your highs jumping, my high kept jumping. Right. And so I was looking all over the place to try and find a, um, a dream book to see if it could explain this dream. Thing. And the dream yeah. was, I was on the common, and when I was on the common, I was walking on the common, and I saw about four boys coming towards me. And when the boys got to, say, about 10 foot or so away from me, I saw one of them go down in the ground like that and come up with a long knife. But they didn't actually stab me, no. you know, with the knife yeah. coming towards yeah. me. But I woke up. You woke up, right. So I wanted to find out what that dream meant. And I could never find out what that dream But it was always in my mind because my eyes kept jumping, kept jumping, jumping. Mm. So I remember saying to Stephen that morning when he was coming down the stairs and he was looking at me, looking through the window. The reason why I was looking through the window I was feeling really down the fact that I wasn't able to work and yeah. I was seeing people going to work, work. and I couldn't go to work and I, I was in a sense I wanted to be able to work and look after my family mm. and it wasn't happening yeah so he he saw me looking through the window three times he went upstairs he came back down he asked me are you okay dad and I said yes he went down to the kitchen came back up and he said it again and the last time before he left he also asked me again and I said I was okay. Anyway, I watched him walk out the door and go down the alleyway and go to school. And um, I did dinner that evening. Uh, I told him, as I said, not to go anywhere to come straight home. So I did dinner. I was sitting there waiting for him to come and eat and he didn't come. So me, me and Georgie and Stuart sat down and we had our dinner. But I took his dinner and his mother's dinner and I put it in the oven. So I'm still waiting for him to come. But then, about 9 o'clock, um, Doreen rang me to say she was in Woolwich. So I went and I picked her up. And I, and I came back home. Still no Steve. And we used to tell him, try to come back before 10 o'clock. So 10 o'clock came, no Steve. Watched the news. Then about halfway through the news, the bell rang. 
So I came down and I said to him, you left your keys. But when the door opened, it was Jerry Shepherd and his father outside the door telling me that they saw Stephen and his friend being attacked on the well out road. So he said to us, call the police and find out what's happening. So we did that and they kept telling us that they, they didn't know anything about that. So anyway, we jumped in the car, went down to Wellall Road. Wellall Road is a wide road, so you can see right down the road. So we're looking to see if there's a flashing blue light or something down there. Nothing. So we then decided we'll go to the hospital. So we went to the hospital. When we got to the hospital, there's only a policeman in the car sitting with his foot out, one standing at the door. So I went in. She went in before me, and then I went in after her. And she was looking all over the place, couldn't find him. But then when I went in, I saw doing. So we stopped doing to find out what was, what was happening. But then the, the, um, the nurse and the doctor stopped us and told us that they had seen him. Right. So we had to wait in a room until they came and tell us what was happening. So we stayed in the room for a while. And then about half an hour or so, they came back and told us that Stephen was dead. I mean, I would, I, 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 I'm four years, three and a half, four years, I think three years actually younger than Stephen. And I remember it vividly. Mm. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I remember when I first encountered yourself and, and, and I just thought, wow, I would never have thought that, you know, we'd, you'd even be here sitting in my kitchen today. Yeah. Um, but I just remember that whole feeling of that situation, being a similar age to Stephen at the time and um, just the sense of helplessness and how sad I felt and angry mm -hmm. I felt about that whole situation and what would go on to happen. Um, before we talk a bit more about that, tell me about um, Dwayne. Dwayne was his friend, obviously, and, and as a father, how did you feel about Dwayne and his friendship? Was he a boy that you didn't mind him hanging around with? Was he a boy that you had some concerns with? As we do as fathers sometimes with our yeah. children. How, how, how was that? And, and how, after the incident as well, did you feel about Dwayne and, uh, in the immediate aftermath of what happened? Well, we, we got to know Dwayne um, before um, Stephen went to Black Eagle Club because Dwayne is... Um, Godfather is Stephen's uncle. Right. Okay. And so we knew him. Yes. And um, the only time we started to have a kind of a kind of feeling about behavior doing is after Stephen went to school, doing and he was in the same class. Mm. And I don't know what had happened, but St Stephen started to go behind in his work, and the teacher had to call us in. Mm. And they were saying that when Stephen and Stuart, and St when Stephen and Dwayne were sitting together, he was distracted. Stephen wasn't doing his work. Right. Yeah. So the the teacher had said to us that we had to, they had to move him mm -hmm. from Dwayne. Right. So that was the only that's time the only, that we started out yeah. some kind of concern. Yeah, yeah. But then um, after that, Dwayne did something and was suspended from that school. So he, he had to go to another school. Right. Anyway. The evening when I when when I said to Steve the day when I said to Steve was to come straight home, mm. Dwayne had left his school and went to Stephen's school to meet him and invited him to go to his uncle okay. to play video games. Mm. And when everything started to happen and then we heard that was doing with was him, I was angry. Yes. Yeah, I was angry naturally. because I had said to myself, I had told my son to come home and you had gone to that school and invite him yeah. to go somewhere else. Mm. One of the things which used to happen in the early days was if 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 we went out anywhere mm. and there was a fight or anything, yeah. none of us would run away. Yes. We would defend would that all, person. Yeah. Yes. And yeah. for the fact that I was told that doing run away and left Stephen. You, that gave you even more. Yeah, that made me more angry. Yes. The other situation is that doing was traumatized. And I never know nothing about traumatizing. No, at the people. time you're just thinking about your yeah, son. I'm thinking that about he was with, that he, he, was had, that he had, he, as you said, in be yeah. able to leave somewhere where yeah, he shouldn't so have been So you should going. come and explain to me what happened. Yes. And he didn't do that. No. So what we were listening to was rumors. Yes. And so the rumors that we was hearing that doing run away and leave Stephen, mm -hmm. and Stephen got stabbed to death. Yes. So. <clears throat> 
my my thought was that the best thing to kind of get to grips with everything to find out exactly even before we even think about court cases and things because as as we found out the police wasn't you doing the case the way they, they're supposed to and yeah. the reason why i knew that was every night for the last how many years before i go to bed i used to watch a program called law and order yeah and i used to see some of the, the way these people would manage the cases. cases and i was expecting some these of these police things to happen do something near it and it wasn't happening and it wasn't happening right so that was one of the main reasons why we we got a, a solicitor right because you just felt we just something felt wasn't right something wasn't right but we didn't act mm -hmm. i didn't know what it was right so when we got the solicitor we felt more easier that the solicitor could explain to us what should happen because it wasn't happening right Anyway, the fact that that Duane didn't speak to us mm. was troubling. Right. I wanted to be able to talk to him to hear his side of the story, and it, the only time we actually heard Duane's side of the story was when we took out the old style committal and went to Belmarsh, and he had to give evidence. And what? Why was that? Why was it that you just even on a community level, never mind the police, on a community level, you say that Duane's Godfather is Stephen's uncle. Yeah. So why couldn't it even have happened through that channel that Dwayne could have just come around the house? Well, he did explain. come. Right. He didn't come, but he wasn't talking. Okay. He and came. that was due to the trauma that he yeah. was. That wasn't due to any ill will. That's it. it. At the yeah, time, yeah, it probably yeah. it felt like that. Yeah, but okay. we didn't understand no, about of course, these things. Of course. Of and, course. And, and so that was troubling. Yes. Not hearing from the person who more or less could tell you the exact thing. Mm -hmm. Plus the fact that the, the police wasn't doing what they were supposed to do. And then we have been sent a liaison officer who wasn't helping. Right. So all of that, with the trauma of us losing, your son. losing a son, police not doing the work they're supposed to be doing, His friend the person who was there not mount. talking to us. Oh. So it just mounted up. Yeah. Wow. It just mounted up. Yeah. And so... The, the fact that this pressure was on me and my ex yes. made it even worse. Of course. Because we couldn't come to terms with something that we didn't know about. Yeah. The first time I started to kind of have a little bit of insight into what happened to people in our situation is when I decided to do introduction to counseling. Because in my mind, bereavement was a loss of your son or, or, or a family member, yeah. not realizing that bereavement is the loss of anything. Anything, anyone. Anything, anyone. Mm. So I then started to understand because what I was looking at, the fact that I was grieving in a special way, I was expecting my ex to do the to same. Do the same. Yeah. And she wasn't doing it no. the way I was doing it. Yeah. So then you start thinking, well, she's just grieving. Yeah. It's only me who was grieving. Yeah. And so that was one of the main reasons why we started to your relationship of, started, started to, to fall apart yeah yeah and it, i mean i i remember just feeling such pain when yeah. i when i saw in the media that that it, it was obvious that your relationship wasn't the same mm. i remembered feeling so yeah. much anger yeah um towards uh, get these these men yeah. and the whole situation that they they'd been able to do this and the fact that the police as well had, had potentially played a major part in that because they were such major shortcomings with, with what they hadn't done and and etc um so talk about the way now and when that changed when your feelings towards the way changed when i heard when i heard him give his evidence at the the introduction the introduction the, the, the court thing yeah all of a sudden i'm hearing from him for the first time although he wasn't speaking to me directly You're i understand what he was going through at the same time yeah because at first I thought he was just a guy who ran away and leave my son, mm -hmm. not knowing that he was messed up himself. Yeah, yeah. So then I started to try and find a way to speak to him. Mm -hmm. Before I had tried very much and it wasn't happening, so I left, just left him. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> the trial, after the fact that the police had given up the case and we went. We did a private prosecution. Mm -hmm. Was the other thing that I was worried about. Yeah. What had happened then the night before before Adoen gave his evidence? I kept asking the police about the fact that there were officers in the force that was 
part of the um, the role of the Adam case were treated about their family badly. Yes. I Roland Adams, Roy Dougal and Arthur Blair family came to my house yes. and was explaining to me what had happened with them, with the police. And how they would how they were untreated. treated. Yeah. So I kept asking the, the officers who were in charge of my, our case, is there any officer was who was involved, involved with the, the other people's case involved in mine? Right. And he said no. But then when, when Duane was supposed to give his evidence the night before he was supposed to give the one of the actual police officers who was supposed to be having a relationship with the, 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 the Norris family was the one who stayed with doing the night before he gave his evidence. <laughs> and we didn't know any of that until after the inquiry that this guy was with doing. And what then doing did the, night, the morning when he was supposed to give his evidence is to change his evidence. So by the fact that he had changed the evidence, the, the, the judge threw the case out. Right. Because if you give her evidence, you give you, her you, the, and you change it, it's not reliable. It, yeah. You're not seen as a reliable witness. So that <clears throat> that made me angry. Yeah. That made me angry. Yeah. And at the same time, I was angry before because I knew my son as a person who would never interfere with anybody. Yeah. And I couldn't, I couldn't see how. A person was just looking to go home on the other side of the road, waiting for a bus, for you to come across that road and kill that person. Mm. So again, and it felt like there was more to it as yeah, well. Yes, so I couldn't, I couldn't understand it. And then, as you say, I started having some really bad thoughts. And I'm thinking that people had come to me in the early days and said if I wanted them to take Deal care of these people. And I, I just thought to myself, well... <laughs> If I did that, mm. I've just lost my son. And then it come out that I had anything to do with these people. I would end up in prison. Mm. So I'd lose the rest of my family. Yeah. And so I kept saying to them, whenever they came, I said, no, leave it. Mm. And then because of my, my background with my, my mother and, and, and my family being Christians, yeah. I just couldn't bring myself to even to start to have the conversation yeah, about conversation. what it would look like to, yeah. to, to, to get and um, even even as when they when they had the inquiry um, a group of guys came from Brixton <clears throat> with the intention of doing something and I I spoke to him and tell him no and if you you remember the, 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 the chaos when they came out uh, elephant and castle yeah that's, I it that's like what yesterday. they did because they couldn't do what they wanted that's the only thing they could they do, could do yeah. and they did it mm. And you know, my life and the whole of my family life has been turned upside down. Yeah. And the anger that I felt mm. was the fact that my son was an innocent child, yes. would never do something to anybody. Yeah. And we were put through the mill by the, what would call it, the, the way these people who were supposed to be, I, I used to say to people, Scotland Yard, Police was a worldwide company known over the world of one of the best police force in the world. And what happened to us, it took me a long time to even believe it could happen. We're going to take a break right there yeah. and we're going to come back talking about the police. Have you been denied access to your child? Or is the time you get to spend with your child dependent on the quality of relationship you have with their mother? Here at Father Figure Children and Family Services, we want to support fathers to maximize their role within the lives of their children by supporting them to regain contact with children whom they have been unjustly denied access to. On average, a family lawyer will cost anything from £250 per hour. However, we offer a court advocacy support service which operates at a fraction of the price with an even more personalized service. We will not only guide and support you every step of the way, but we also provide parental coaching as and when necessary. We'll fill in the forms, write position statements for court, attend court, as well as negotiate with a respondent solicitor. We believe that our 100% success rate of re-establishing contact between fathers and children is due to our ethos, which views the child as the client. You don't just pick us, we choose you too. If you'd like support establishing contact with your child, visit our book online page at www.fatherfigure.org.uk and book yourself a free consultation now. That's www.fatherfigure.org.uk. OK, 
Okay, welcome back. And um, got to say a shout goes out to our sponsors, uh, Port Royal Patties. Um, look out for the brand new Big Up Patty from Port Royal and um, Encona Pepper, hot pepper sauce. There, they come in the beef flavor, the jerk chicken flavor, which everyone seems to want to have a bit of nowadays. And um, for those who love animals and the world, vegan flavor. All right, so check out uh, Port Royal Patties for that. Mr. Dr. Neville Lawrence. So we just um, finished the last segment uh, touching on the police and essentially the corruption. And we know that essentially what had happened after, as a result of, of, of Stephen's death, is that we had the, the inquiry, yeah. the McPherson inquiry, yeah. um, where it was, it was um, stated that the police were institutionally racist. racist. Yeah. Something that I guess was nothing new to us really. I guess what made it, it was it was something to celebrate yes. because it was being said in public and it was being said by one of their own, yes. not us. Yeah. Not the people who've been on the receiving end and knew um, that we were being dealt with in, uh, unjustfully in, in many occasions and have been, but it was being said by the establishment this time. And exactly. so it, it definitely felt different yeah. and it definitely felt new. Um, and something that has gone on to shake and, and change things um, most definitely, unfortunately, at the cost of the bereavement and the hurt and the pain of your family. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a bit about the police, because obviously, you know, you now come to realise um, that these people were covering things up. Um, they weren't doing things properly. How does that make you feel? I mean, your son, Stephen, was an innocent boy. He wasn't someone who was going out and doing stuff and maybe the police had a vendetta um, not to maybe carry out justice on, on this innocent, on this person's behalf because maybe he was involved and, and, you know, they would, even though it would have been wrongfully, they were trying to seek their own justice. This was an innocent young man. Um, it was obvious he was innocent. So how does how, how do you feel after the fact, and and how do you make that transition from actually um, going from this organisation who have who have unjust unjustfully dealt with your case and, and and hidden things and not done things properly to actually where you're at today, where I know you you, you work with the police. Um, uh, so to speak, in different ways. How how does that tra transition take place? The the fact that these people, some of these main people who are involved in my case, weren't doing their jobs the right and proper way, it then transpired that there was, after so many years of trying to seek justice for my my family and myself for the death of Stephen. Uh, I think something like uh, 15 years after, mm. there actually was an um, or maybe 10, 15, 12, 12 years or so after, there was an actual um, person who took over the case, a right. police officer who took over the case, who started to treat the family in a different, completely different way. Right. Showing kind of sympathy for our families mm -hmm. and doing a lot of things that the others didn't do. Right. And as everybody know, there's good officers and there are bad officers. Mm. My case wasn't the first case that they were that families were dealt in with the, in that way before. As, as I mentioned earlier, Roland, Roland Adams, yeah. Roland Dougal, and Alfred Blair family went through more or less the same kind of situation. Our case, in some ways, we had the Almighty helping us. Because for the very first time, we had a person who had done 27 years in prison meeting with us and making a statement which made a whole lot of difference. Because in the early days, the press wasn't interested in anything that we did. Mm. The story of Stephen wasn't on the front page no. of the paper the day after he was murdered. There was, a, there was a story of a dog on the front page that went through the post. And that made me feel so bad. I mentioned that most of the time when I talked about my case, yeah. which for the first first few weeks was no body no mentioned, press, no press. And from the, that man came out that morning and made a statement 
all of a sudden all the press all the tv people were interested and so that is we were saved by this man yeah and the man i'm talking about is nelson mandela right and when i met with mandela the first time the first morning after being in prison for 27 years i was expecting to see an angry person mm. meeting me that morning and yeah. the man i met influenced the way i was going to be treating people and deal with my case he was cool calm and collected mm-hmm. and was i said to myself i would love to be like this man yeah and that man influenced my way of doing what i've been doing for the past so many years mm. and i wanted to try and help my 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 young kids and and the, 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 the families who've been through hell yeah and never get any kind of justice and what my in the back of my mind is that i'm going to keep going and try and get some kind of justice but also to get some kind of justice for my my other families who never had it yeah and 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 somehow also the fact that i i was in a, a family who was christian people influenced what i did and yeah. the first thing i did that morning when i got up after the the night before i thought it was a dream and when i when i got up in order to 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 see whether or not i had lived through that at night or something had happened to steven i had to go upstairs to his room and look in his bed to see if he had slept in it because i couldn't believe what had happened and when i realized what had happened and that steven was really gone I had to come downstairs, pick up the phone and start calling my friends and and relatives to tell them what I what I had to tell them. And before I did that, I said to myself, who is going to help me now? And the first thing that came into my my brain was the almighty father is the one who was going to help. And I prayed and asked for guidance and protection and asked for strength. and that's where i went yeah because i knew no ordinary person nobody alive could not okay. understand what i was going through yeah and so that the road, that's the road i traveled mm. and sometimes people ask me even now how often do you pray and i said to them even sometimes i'm walking on the street i'm in the bus i'm on a train i'm praying mm-hmm. because he's been my strength yeah Uh, without him i maybe wouldn't be sitting here with you and I, and i take it this is how you was able to because i know that um in 2018 which was the 25th um anniversary of steven's death um there was a lot spoken about about your forgiveness for yeah. for um the, the his murderers yeah um i take it this is how you were able to move on to that path of of forgiveness that was one of the ways i was able to mm. but at the same time i think some people you know how i was able to make that decision i thought that in order to forgive somebody they had to ask your permission right or beg for forgiveness yeah. and i was saying to myself i would never forgive these boys unless they ask me right i went to um, a seminar called living love life seminar mm-hmm. and there was a mother and father who came up and gave um a talk about the way they had lost their son yeah their son was killed in front of them they were there on the spot when there was when their son was to death mm-hmm. and when these people started talking about the way in which their son was killed and what they had to go through i started crying their son was kicked to death crossing a bridge the three guys who did it went and got a car after they kicked him to death and pulled him along the road and these pe- these parents were hawks to go and visit these guys what killed their son in prison and they went and they asked their this these parents to forgive them and they, they said okay we'll go away and think about it and they went away think about it and they came back and they told them that they forgive them 
They then came out of prison and then went back to the family to ask them to help them to turn their life around. And they asked the, the permission to go and visit the boy that they had killed. And they said when they went with these boys to the graveside and saw the outpouring of grief, they realized that these boys were really sorry for what mm, they did. Yeah. And they helped these boys to turn their life around. Mm. And I came back out of that, I came out of that, meet, that seminar that evening. And I said to myself, if these people can do that, can do this, I can. Mm. And so I went back to Jamaica. I I normally go to the same church that I'm now a part of. Mm. And I spoke to some of my brothers and sisters in the church and I said to them, I need for you to do a search and write down what it is you have to do to forgive somebody. And they came back with about nine or ten pages different scriptures. The scriptures and how you're supposed to do it, what you have to do. And all my intention is that I, I was going to read this survey and then make the decision whether or not I was going to get baptized. Right. After I read it and realized that you don't have to ask permission, you don't have to be friends with these people, mm. you can do it without their say so. I decided I was going to get baptized in January this year. Stephen was born on the 13th of September. I was born on the 13th of March. And I am thinking that this is going to be a new life for me. Mm. So I wanted to get um, baptized on the 13th of January, okay. which I did. Okay. And since then you've, you've felt... Well, let me tell you something, mm. and, and sometimes people don't realize. I wasn't able to sleep at nights. I was so tormented about the fact that I wanted to find a way to run these boys over with a car or something, a truck should Some hit kind of kill them. Yeah, and it, it's played on my mind so much that sometimes I went to, to bed, couldn't sleep. I got baptized on the 13th of January on the Saturday. Mm. I couldn't wake up the Sunday morning. The first night's sleep. I slept. So peacefully, I <laughs> said to myself, if I'd done this, I would have done that long, long ago. <laughs> you had a holy for sleep. I slept in such a way that I've never slept in years. Wow. And I, I just felt really good about myself yeah. that I was able to do this. Yeah. And that's when, when we came back on the 25th of, of, um, of April, mm. I, I, I made well, I, I said it before before I even came back to Jamaica from from Jamaica, Jamaica and the, the film. Yes. And the, 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 the documentary. The documents, and didn't even realize I did it. Okay. I did not realize I did it because I'm thinking, I knew I said this to somebody. Who the hell did I say this to? And then it clicked. They did ask me about forgiveness yeah. on the thing. On the documentary. And I said it. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that I said it before the documentary came out. Mm. So I did it before the That's documentary. Good. And I've, and one of the things I think I've I've recognised about forgiveness is that it's it, it's as much as about you as it is about the person yeah. because yeah. it's about yeah. freeing you up. Yeah. And being able to for yeah. you to be able to move on. And I think I've recognised. I didn't know you before 2018. We've our paths have paths have crossed, which we will go on to speak about. But. Prior to that, I'd only known you through the media. Yeah. But I can see a massive change in, yeah. in Neville Lawrence, the person that I had seen before. Um, and not, when I say a massive change, I, I don't think you've ever been saying anything negative, I yeah. say. Yeah. But in, just in your persona, oh, yeah, this, yeah. I can see a, 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 you're, a bit, you're, much, you're glowing. Yeah. A bigger, I've, let go, a I've let go of everything and just yeah. leave it. Yeah. So it can, um, what you'd say, it, it will do itself. Yeah. Because... Forgiveness is about leaving the Almighty to do what He needs to do. Yeah, yeah. He makes that decision, not you. Mm -hmm. So when you leave everything up to Him, then you free your, your, your mind and, yeah. and everything about the fact that you want to do something horrible. Yeah, I, I understand that totally. So then um, let's move on to some of the work you're doing now. And uh, well, before, I guess, well, yeah, so, uh, you, would, you, uh, you were going into a lot of schools. Well, one what, what of the things which I, I felt was missing yeah. when after Stephen's death and I, we had started the, the campaign mm -hmm. 
And um, I had um, uh, one of the, the first person that was in charge of the, who took control of the campaign with me as part of it, was a woman called Beverly Blade. Mm -hmm. And she, I started asking about questions which I think maybe the young people in the school should be told certain things about people who came from abroad because their oh, parents yeah. used to tell them a lot of bad things. And um, we were talking one evening when we was at the office and she said to me, Neville, you know the best thing maybe you could do is to go into schools. And so we put, this is um, the fact that I was available to go into schools in the teacher's journal that goes out every year to different, different schools. Right. And the first week we had over 100 requests wow. to go to school. So I used to go all over the place, you know, Birmingham, Liverpool, the lot, and just talk to the kids. And the, the, the things I used to tell the kids, especially the, the white kids, is the fact that we, as a, um, a people in the Caribbean, live a different lifestyle from the one they live here. Yeah. And we don't go around thinking that we hate anybody because we haven't got time for that. No. Right? So when your, your father or your mother is telling you bad things about somebody from abroad they've never been abroad yeah right so what they're telling you is nothing compared to the life that we live and i said to them even some of the the, the food that you eat like say the banana the orange you don't realize the some of the things that these people who grow these vegetables and the coffee that you drink mm -hmm. Well, early in the morning, these people have to get, get up out. and go and look after these crops for you to sit around your table and eat that banana and drink that coffee. Mm -hmm. For you to be cursing people who are doing that for you yeah. without you even knowing is out of order. Yeah. In order for you to understand people, maybe your family should start going abroad and looking mm. for people the way they live yeah. and benefiting you for sitting around your table and mm. eating. Yeah. And you know what I did? They came to Jamaica, about eight or nine office, um, BBC people came to Jamaica to do um, a, a documentary. And um, I think this was the first documentary that we did after Stephen. I was in a hotel down in Ochi. And um, we had to go to Stephen's gravesite for them to do a clip. And we normally have um, all the different fruits from banana, coconut, hockey, chocolate, you know, everything, cane. Yeah. I was in this field where Stephen is buried, this piece of land which is belonging to Doreen. It's an acre land. Mm. And after they finished the filming, we were standing there and I said to one of them, you're drinking a coconut. Can you show me this tree? And the coconut, we, we have about 10 or 15 coconut trees there couldn't point it out and right beside Stephen's grave there's a there's a chocolate tree with the chocolates on it and I said to one of them show me a chocolate tree he couldn't show me I said you drink coffee show me a, a coffee tree and they're all there I said to them cane the sugar cane which makes it sugar and also rum show me one of them none of these guys could show me anything and I had to start showing them the trees I said these are the trees that these people in this country planted for you to benefit from when you sit around your table yeah. in the mornings. Yeah. So tell me about the dot trip and how that's come about. I take it it's as a result of some of these work, the work you did in schools and things like that. The work I do in schools, been, been, I've been doing that for quite a while and, and, and sometimes people don't realize that it's just, it's not just one doctorate I have, I have four doctorates. Oh wow. The reason why I had to start using this one is that when we, the Fort Smith, I used to be a regular visitor to the university and talk to students to do with law mm -hmm. and the way we did our case. Right. And a lot of our students use Stephen's case okay. for their, 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 their final, final dissertation. dissertation. Right. And so for them to know a little bit more about the case, I used to go to Fort Smith. And lecture so, yeah, and, and talk to them right so when i went to Portsmouth and they decided to give me the doctorate they said to me when you get this doctorate you have to use it 
Right. If you don't use it, we're going to take it. You're going to lose it. Use it or lose so, it. <laughs> so that's why I started using it. But then at the same time, the fact that I was given this doctorate, and I, I, I'm one of those people who, who don't like to more or less to, what you, to, to feel that I'm better than other people. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I didn't use it. Right. So now that I've got it, I'm making good use of it. Right. The fact now that I'm using it, it's giving me more, you know, more what you say, we would call it more, what do you call it? More clout. More clout. More recognition. And, and more recognition. Mm -hmm. And plus, the fact that we've now started the VPCB, yes. it's more handy and, to and use it And you've, well. you've just thrown in an acronym, VCPB, which stands for Violent Crime. Violent Crime Prevention Board. Right. Which is something with all of these um, other members who are given the time free to try and do something positive to right. help the young people. You, your company, which is Father to Figure, That's right. um, we got their um, Father to Father, mm -hmm. which concentrate on young boys, especially the boys who has no fathers. Yeah. Is something that I'm really proud of you people doing, mm -hmm. and I think it's essential that I've made I've made it plain every time I speak in public that we have to look after ourselves. We can't wait for other people to do things yeah. for us. We know what we need to do with our young people, yeah. and we are the best people who should be doing it. So so far we've managed to do. We've got a website, mm -hmm. which is VCPB dot hog mm -hmm. that we show people when we give them a pin we tell them to go to the site and look at what we're doing and also invite other people who are doing anything to do with young people to be part of what we're doing to help our young people yeah and i feel proud about the, the fact that we're doing the, that all the members in this organization are doing this free yeah. they're not being paid mm -hmm. to do this and so it's something that we want to do yeah and with the help of the Almighty, I'm sure we're going to do a lot of good yeah. with this organization. And yeah. We're going to go from strength to strength. Definitely. And I can say I'm very proud to be a part of that board, which is how we our paths yeah. um, crossed for the first time. And um, as you said, I, I would agree that, you know, the, the people who do sit on that board, not, none of uh, no one is there because they are trying to get paid or trying to get any recognition. No. Um, so it is something really inspirational and I'm... I'm, I'm very proud to be a part of it. So, so how's life now? I mean, you're here now. I, it, it feels like you are not always here, and it feels like you've been here for an extended period. Well, it's the reason why I'm here till now because normally I usually leave here about September, October. Mm -hmm. And when we started this organisation first, it wasn't going the way we would like it to go. Right. With the help of um, Dr. Angelo mm -hmm. and you. Courtney and yourself and all the other members we sat down and th thought about where we would like to go yeah and so far we've managed to set it on the course that we'd like it to be going on yeah uh, we as you say we've now got a trauma surgeon board mm -hmm. so we're trying to touch all the different bases that we need to touch to help these youngsters yeah and as I say with the help of the Almighty I'm sure we're gonna be some kind of force Impact. to reckon with yeah. in, in the, the new year coming. I hope that we go from strength to strength. And I'm sure everybody's going to do their best to yeah. make it work. So you'll be off soon, going back to Jamaica. And how, that, well, how does that work? Do you spend, how long do you normally spend in Jamaica? In the I UK? normally spend six months in Jamaica. This year I've spent maybe about, uh, I haven't spent much time in Jamaica. I came here in March. In 2018, you in see, it, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I, I'm going back in, in the 15th of, Ju um, of um, January. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, I'll be back by March, and it's to do with the fact that we've now got um, a Stephen Lawrence Day. You are. Also, the fact that we're trying to to have um, the the the, 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 the go it's going to be 20 years next next year that the inquiry was, was 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 done right there's some organization which is part of the the, the university that gave me the doctorate right 
some of the, the, the people in the in the university done two books so far to right. do with the inquiry. Okay. And they're planning a next one. Right. The third one. When I come back, we're trying to to have an event to commemorate the 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 um, the twentieth. The twentieth year of the inquiry. Of the inquiry. Yes. The first so I will want to try and use that as a a way of reminding people that there's still a lot of stuff from the inquiry that that's, that hasn't been we used still yet. Right. Well, we want to know exactly where it is. Right. So a survey. We need a survey. Right. Of the inquiry okay. To, okay. to see exactly where we are and where we need to. How how, need. how, how much distance oh. have been travelled yeah, exactly. from the the, the recommendations that was made. been used? Okay. So we're going to try and push for that. Okay. And hopefully, if we get that, then we can know. We also want to try and set up because we, the, the, the 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 Jack Straw when he. When he when we, when they the in the in prior finished his work, he set up a, a, a group that used to monitor the the inquiry to see right, who to is see doing what. what. Right. That been that been disbanded. And he was the home secretary. At he the was time. the home secretary at the stage. Yeah. I had approached the prime minister now that, that when she was home secretary, I had approached her to ask if there was any way we could re-establish it. It hasn't happened, right? But with this new push to do with the twentieth year we coming, can maybe put some more pressure on I the government. I'm try and put some more pressure. Yeah. I'm talking. Okay. I'm seeing, trying to see if I can meet with the Home Secretary, which is the now new Home Secretary, and talk to him and see how far we can push to see okay. if this can happen. Okay. Sounds good. Well, Doctor, I think that brings us to the end of our very informative chat. I've learned quite a few new things today mm. um, speaking to you um, I'd like to thank you for, for joining me and joining us on our first podcast but more so I want to thank you on behalf of this country um, a community for um, the the tireless work that you've put in to seek justice not just for Stephen but for everyone yeah. who, who uh, may be subject to the injustice that your family was subject to so thank you um, thank you for being a great example to us especially when you talk about forgiveness yeah. which we know is something very difficult and, and I'm sure there'll be people who will have listened to you and have thought not me <laughs> good luck to you but not me yeah. um, but thank you for being a great example and thank you for joining us yeah it's my pleasure and um, as I say what we're doing is not just for us only it's for the whole community mm -hmm. and with a bit of love from the community and also from the police force. We're gonna try and see if there's any way we can work together to make things better for our youngsters out there. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Fathers Matter 2 podcast with your host, David Mullings. Sponsored by Port Royal Paddies and Father Figure Children and Family Services. Keep checking in as we will be regularly releasing new episodes. Fathers matter too.